So these images that you'll see at the beginning are various iterations of this sculpture I call Late Bloomer. This is the one that is in Milwaukee. Um, and there are a few different um, vantage points of it there. Every time I install this, I use different plants. Um, but as it's Milwaukee and this sculpture was meant to be up for a year, obviously it couldn't keep the plants in it. Um, but each time I've done it, I've sort of uh, tailored the plant selection and the location. Um, and this is a version, the first version that I did of it actually, that was at um, Socrates. And that's a version that was at my house. Um, and these are just sort of some detail shots showing it. And this fish that you can kind of see there, um, it sort of is a little bit of a stand-in for me. And so it's always a decal on the truck no matter where it is or where, what plants are getting installed in it. Um, but this one uh, was when it was at my house and this was sort of my first attempt to do a cover for this sculpture in particular. The idea of doing covers for outdoor sculptures came from partly a pragmatic standpoint. How do I protect these things that I make? They're large scale, but they're, you know, in the elements. 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. So if there are sensitive elements, like in this piece um, with plants, what do, I, what do I do about that? How do I deal with it? Um, and can I do anything uh, besides just strapping a tarp over a sculpture? Uh, so this is actually more like a greenhouse cover that I put on it and I kept the plants in there. And it was actually the first time that I'd used aquatic plants in a sculpture. But um, when that show was meant to come down, they invited me to uh, re-envision the piece or add something else, do something different to it so that it could last through the winter. Uh, this terrace is on the fifth floor of the Whitney and obviously can't keep plants in it throughout the year. Um, so I donated the plants to local aquatic uh, gardens, botanic gardens. And then in, in an effort to make a completely different sculpture, I, after emptying the tanks out, I flipped them over um, and the windmills that were in, in this piece originally uh, used to aerate the ponds, I just used still the air tubes coming from the windmills, put them under the tank and then miked them so that it became a sound installation for the fall, winter and early spring. So that was really the first time I did attempt this idea of using the same sculpture, but turning it into something else. The idea of the covers, and you can see here, so none of this was covered. It was really, the tanks were just emptied and um, turned upside down. This, this piece in particular felt like a thing that I really did need to figure out how to cover. It's, it was uh, installed out in Long Island and they were about to have a hurricane or really strong winds. And so the next slide is like, quick hurry, how do we make a cover for this? And obviously, I've used tarps in my work before. So this was a natural go-to for me. This was last summer actually, um, but it allowed me an opportunity to think about this idea of making special covers for each sculpture, um, each large scale outdoor sculpture and that these covers would then be uh, sculptures in and of themselves, whether the object was underneath or not. So. Uh, it's kind of a twofer in a way, like you're getting, you know, this, you're getting to see the sculpture when it's existing as it's meant to be the way that I build it in my studio or on site. And then the cover offers a new sort of version of that. Then, you know, it, it was sort of this idea, okay, so now I've got this, this, I, this need to cover the sculpture in Milwaukee and what am I going to do with it? And what were the opportunities to do with it? Kelty and I'll get more into that um, in the next section, but I just wanted him to introduce his work and talk about it a little bit and his process of making his work. And then we'll sort of weave the two together. You know, it was, I was so excited when uh, Virginia came to me with this project, part, mainly out of friendship and, and the realization that I had ever, never actually done a collaboration before. So I wanted to bring, um, I don't know, um, my my own energy to to this project, um, and um, I was thinking a lot. So much of my work has radiating lines, radiating rainbows, a lot of color overlay. Um, some metaphors that have guided much of my painting has been um, uh, things or energies or 
diaphanous objects actually passing through each other, diaphanous colors. And that's one reason I'm drawn to spray paint. Like the, um, the originating metaphor would actually be, um, like I read once that two galaxies can collide, but not a single planet or a single sun uh, um, or explode because they are created, because um, they are composed mostly of space. So the, um, um, and I've, got, I've examined these ideas of things passing through each other in lots of different ways. These paintings right here that you're seeing are my most current paintings that I'm working on, um, or this type of work, which I've made of, um, composed just of little square, squares painted. Um, and it's about color overlaid on each other as much as possible, but the background is, is shining through. Um, also at the same time concurrently, and that's sort of at the, the depths of the pandemic, I was working on these drawings, these drawn and drawn paintings that are overlays of different um, waves, different um, that se seem sonic to me and also, also waterly, water-like to me. And there's erasure on top of on top of drawn lines, um, and the erasure is also has its own linearity. Um, and also these, all these works were framed and I, I, I drew on the frames as well. Um, and then I've, I've, always, I've always been interested in, in like a background and a foreground in their disjunctive, um, uh, I don't know, potentials and how they can um, clash and work together, how the background can come forward and the foreground can go backward and how that can create a, I don't know, very lively and sometimes disorienting space to, to exist in for the for me and the viewer. Um, and then also, um, this is, I'm kind of giving you a, a, a grand overview of the last few years. Uh, I have I have works that were um, came out of this drawing language, but then like brought the intensity of color in a more uh, one, I, I don't know, uh, uh, dialectic way where it's just one, one color against another. And then I would build these reliefs out of the, out of the color. Um, so I was thinking, what if paint was extruded through a drawing to make a relief or to make form, kind of like making pasta. <laughs> uh, so if you went to the next, go to the next slide. Uh, this is a similar painting made by this, the, the same way. I think that shows this, the similar relief and this, um, paint is is built up um, with um, uh, you know thickeners and um, and it's about half an inch thick. And then um, the these these paintings are what in, um, motivated me to to get into frames and I began painting the frames. And so this is what was leading me into sort of. I mean, I'm still very. I mean, I'm a, I am very much a. a a painter and ultimately a, a two-dimensional artist, um, but um, it's what has been leading me recently to a more th um, an engagement with um, objectness and three-dimensionality. Um, and yeah. at, at the same time with intensity of color. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go yeah, ahead. no, I was just going to interject. I mean, you didn't you didn't interject when I was when I was rambling on, but no, this was this kind of work. I mean, all of your work in um, general, but this kind of work specifically made me really feel excited about the idea of you um, working on a three-dimensional object, on a sculpture, on something that really was not on the wall at all. Because when I look at this as somebody who, you know, primarily thinks of um, themselves as a, a sculptor and not a painter, um, me, you know, not being a painter, I see this as a sculpture, you know, because of all of those considerations that you're talking about, the frame becomes a sculpture, the application and the material that's stacked on the canvas becomes sculptural, you're calling it a relief, I think it's interesting, you know, the terminology that we, we're both using and coming to this like common ground. Um, it's, 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 it's an interesting um, place to investigate, I think, for both of us. Yeah, I mean, I was literally thinking, what if color became form? Like, can color, and because color is so, I don't know, the most um, uh, unpindownable thing there is, really. Like, even uh, it's relative, it's made, I don't know, is it made of light? Is it, 
it's it's I don't know between the reflection of an object and a and light I think I don't even know like when I try to like put this <laughs> I try to even say this out loud but to me the idea of making of, of color coming from the canvas and becoming a solid thing that you could touch um which of course is what paint already is but that just seemed like like a I don't know it was a very motivating place um for a while and um and and then these paintings did feel built to me um so um because it's it was all like with um I don't know it's a much more exacting way of making things than I normally do yeah. um I sort of in a similar vein but kind of op operating in an opposite way I've been thinking you know the these um I've been thinking about well, well, these drawn paintings that I made, um, what, what, you see one example of here on the right. Um, you know, I think they were, they, were, they were born out of the anxiety of 2019, 2020, the, the, the pandemic. And um, they also were like the logical extension of the drawings I've been making for years. Um, and the idea of like them becoming less material, like leaving, like leaving um, any sort of um, support and going to the wall and um, um, trying to find like a limitless place to operate in and becoming um, as big as a, uh, as big as they can be, which is, um, that was, I don't know, that's the central largest wall I, on my, on my, at, at my last show. And so that's, I don't know, um, a really big stage for um, 30 for, for to, to attack only with a pencil. So that's, 30 feet by 20 feet, basically. Um, and um, I don't know, I, th I thought of this as also a way that I was also leaving, I don't know, right, I don't know, the canvas. Um, and it and this kind of linearity is something that I was gonna, I thought would, would be exciting maybe to bring to a three-dimensional form, which um, was your, you know, was your sculpture. So now we can yeah. go back. Well, hold on, stay on this for one second, yeah. because I think the, the thing that excited me about this, too, is that you created an entire environment like you, mm -hmm. you're you go into that. And I mean, yes, you've got two paintings uh, mm -hmm. on top of this drawing, but it's really you you could get lost in there and, as mm -hmm. you do, like if you create an installation or something, you know, so I think that this this image especially speaks to the way that we realized the piece in uh, Milwaukee for this change from the summer into the winter version because yeah. we sort of we did create a canvas you know in that we'll see it in a second but we but then it also becomes a whole environment um so yeah yeah, so here's the here's the truck and here it is covered um, and voila, it could be done at this point. But um, in a way, the first time collaborating on something like this, uh, doing a cover for an automobile uh, seemed the most streamlined and uh, the best way to take out a bunch of variables and have a blank canvas um and so you know um kelsey and i went back and forth with material and options you know sh should we shrink wrap it and paint that you know like have should we sew something and paint that like what what are the options print some of his paintings on fabric and you know so this was really a way um for us to experiment and and sort of just like as a springboard um, for what might happen. And I think we both went into it pretty open about what that would end up being. Um, but you can see sit under the truck, this uh, gravel um, area, we added that for the winter iteration um, so that again, there's another texture and space um, that Kelty could sort of react to. So, yeah, so this is, I just wanted to throw this in. I don't know if this is the right moment, but um, this is a close up of one of the areas of the cover as Kelty was working. And, you know, it speaks so much to his paintings and his gestural marks and the way that he, you know, puts paint on a surface. And this, this kind of thing, I, I have tons and tons of these sort of close up pictures of the truck cover sculpture cover because I, I do feel like it was 
so exciting to see Kelty specific mark making coming out during this process. Um, even, even, even though he was like, I don't know, I don't, <laughs> but, but I think, you know, it's interesting too, to watch that evolution, um, through, through doing it, you know, you know, in the end, I mean, you know, when we, when we started doing this, I was really excited by the ideas of, uh, of improvising this, especially since that large wall that I showed you had been done with no real pre-planning or meditation. I did a, a practice in my studio at a half the size, and then I just didn't replicate that. I just went and did it again. Um, and so I thought, well, maybe I could do this on, I sort of like bring the same kind of improvisational attitude to, um, to this project. Um, you know, this, this, is, this is very different though. And, you know, it's a three-dimensional object, which in the end is much larger than one expects it to be. And <laughs> we, took, we took the, um, the cover on and off. I worked on it both on the floor, on the ground here. And then I also worked on it on the, um, on the truck as well. And that seemed, that working back and forth seemed to be very fruitful. Um, and, you know, it was one, the, one of the big questions was sort of like how much to change it or not change it or how much to like um, uh, emphasize its truckness <laughs> or how much to like, un, uh, uh, or emphasize the fabricness, the fabric, the, uh, you know, what, what, which objects and which shapes to work with or what against. And I mostly decided to bring my own, uh, um, to try to like, undo the shape, <laughs> which of course is impossible. Uh, and, and, and I think, uh, uh, I don't know, the futility of that, I think, I hope makes something interesting. Um, and then of course, I'm, I wanted to bring like the full, um, in general, I, I always like the idea of bringing every color to, the, to a piece. Of course, there's no such thing as every color. Um, <laughs> but um, at least the full rainbow. Um, yeah, Kelty went for it and started painting the, you know, underlayment, this gravel and the, the ties, the uh, lumber mm. ties that are around it. And I think that that really did a lot to also transform um, the piece into more than just an object that was covered, you know, more than just a truck cover. Um, covering a truck because technically that's not a truck anymore. I know it looks like one to most people, um, but now it's a sculpture. So, um, you know, uh, I, I wanted it to be, I wanted it to feel like that. So this, I think that that worked really well. This is interesting. So the next few are this, just uh, focused on this back uh, tailgate area. And I, I, just so you could see some of like Kelty's layering and process and how much it changes. And, um, you know, I was amazed sort of walking around this thing too and thinking of like how, you know, at the beginning of one day, it looked like one thing at the end of the day, it looked like a completely different thing. Um, there's the, yeah, that's from that area. There's also, um, Brian, I didn't put the time lapse in the, um, in the PowerPoint because it was too, too big to compress and everything, but I wonder if we could show that at the end, you know, maybe while questions are happening or something, um, if, if you have access to that. But I think there are a few more um, photos of the piece there. So you can just see like the, I mean, it's a massive transformation from, this you know to the finished object oh that was the you know what brian that was the um that was the time lapse actually isn't it yeah and yeah um kelty you can talk while it's going yeah i just wanted to talk about about the the gravel and which you know was just a um it kind of came out of like a practical concern of getting lots of paint on the ground and on the sidewalk. And I, I thought <laughs> it would have, um, and then it was also was 
um, a way of, I don't know, um, I guess, yeah, undoing its objectness. I know that's like, that sounds, um, but to create, a, you, or you could say to create an environment or to create mm -hmm. like, a, like a, a world for, for this thing. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know exactly how to describe it, but um, it, it felt um, like a promising thing to do. Um, and, and I've always wanted to paint. I've also, also just always wanted to paint gravel and I've always wanted to paint dirt. <laughs> uh, and, and I think there's something about like, you, you know, your, your work, your work is so like rooted in the earth to me and my work is so like airy. Uh, and I thought that, that little, little stones would sort of link it together. Yeah. Yeah, it's Michelle, you guys. Hello. Sorry, I'm Hi. having some connection trouble here in Rome, Georgia. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, thanks for your patience. And, and, you know, I'm so delighted that you're here. Um, uh, both of you are I'm your biggest fan. Uh, a, a little bit. Likewise. Kelly, you're, you're going down a really interesting trail, uh, I, I think. And that is how you're thinking about not only working on the gravel, um, but how you're thinking about full spectrum and how light moves, right? That uh, mm -hmm. how the animated pigment of uh, the painting that you use works the way and moves the way light moves. And I think that that is a kind of reference to Mm, dissolve uh, and how you work to dissolve that thing that is a truck. I think that's really mm -hmm. extraordinary. But then in juxtaposition with Virginia's work that really deals with phenology, the idea of time or seasons, um, you know, a different kind of time. And I think just together, you know, there's similarities, there's dependencies with the idea of season and light um, and how light moves, but then also kind of a difference in terms of, you know, materiality. Um, and, and so I'm just uh, kind of underscoring what you start, the, the kind of path you started going on, um, going down with, um, you know, uh, painting the gravel, thinking about light, thinking about dissolve, um, you know, particularly in, you know, the dark season up in, uh, you know, Wisconsin, the cold season. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think you're saying it better than I am, um, <laughs> not, which I'm not surprised by, but yeah, in, and there definitely was some thought about like, oh, I imagine that you know, this will have a long existence in snow and, and melting snow and, and it'll be this bright, radiating, uh, wild, uh, wild thing. I, I, I was hoping that it would, I, that's, I don't know, and I wanted it to have the, to, to I don't know, uh, maintain its, its wildness, I, I can't, which, which I guess, um, I didn't want to become like a, a well-behaved thing in the end either. Um, I'm just, Virginia, do you have anything to add to this? I, yeah, no, I, I think that's interesting too. I mean, you know, you, you'd you mentioned earlier light and color are things that are hard to capture. Um, maybe in this, this photograph, uh, everybody would disagree with us because I mean, <laughs> you've kind of done an amazing job. But I do think, I mean, for me, the thing that happened, um, you know, when we were there is that this piece looks like a completely new piece. And that, that for me um, was really where I wanted, where I hoped it would go. Um, and a new piece with your you know, your mark, literally, but also sort of the idea of your marks, your thoughts juxtaposed, you know, not juxtaposed, but put on top of it, um, you know? Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's actually something I didn't say in the beginning that I meant to, is that um, also something that I'm interested in and that is kind of the basis of all of these bodies of work is like, is a mark retaining its, selfhood or its truthiness or it's uh and not not pretending to be anything that it's not not um being in service of illusion which it so much of mark making and painting is uh and of course there is illusion like there's illusion of light and i mean or maybe there's real light here there's real reflection there's real color but um yeah I, so so that's one reason why i tend i I mean, I think it's why, I, it's the best way I can explain why I tend to make um, pictures or, or, or fields out of uh, many marks or many um, 
like a cacophony or symphony of uh, of of marks on top of each other because I want them to I don't know be an army of selves <laughs> uh, and um, that's uh, and so you know and I tend to in one piece tend to commit to a mark and in here this piece I piece I connect I committed to these like radiating waves that started off a lot more fluid and then they got kind of straighter as they went on as I worked on it didn't it. Um, yeah. yeah, that was something that uh, well, amazed me, just the transformation, you know, I think I mentioned it earlier, but just over the course of a couple of hours, um, for sure, you could see such a change and evolution of the, the mark making, which was really cool, because you were really reacting and you're making decisions on site and in the moment. And um, for me, that was exciting to see. Yeah. Yeah. So I put this one in because really Kelsey and I did this as an excuse to hang out and have fun. I mean, it's what, you know, we, <laughs> we spent a lot of time yucking it up and I think that, that, you know, it, it was just very free flowing. Um, but no, but seriously, it was a really uh, fruitful collaboration on a lot of levels. Okay. So happy to listen to both of you. Um, so I, I'm, you know, this is a bit of a forced con question around context, um, but you know, I particularly love uh, the idea that it's at the library, right? And again, it goes to uh, both of your strengths, but also um, uh, your the the difference, um, your different kind of engagement, right? So I would say, uh, Virginia, um, how you work with science or the natural world or things, things that can be named, right? Um, and then. Kelty, I would say that you know you are in a platonic realm, always dealing with abstractions, thinking about again the idea of light, thinking about ideas. So there are two different kinds of vocabularies, and then you're at the library, right? And I think the library and knowledge um, and curiosity is really important um, as a foundation to get to uh, an imaginative place where you bring your paintings Kelty and Virginia where you bring your sculpture right it's not you know that you're, you're you know you're not illustrating anything but you are taking you know whether it's ideas or articulations in uh indexical languages from the natural world and evolving them into poetics um so I, I you know, this may be a comment um I just love that it's cited at the library um, for that reason um and I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about the juxtaposition of the library, of course, it is a hugely important civic um, uh, structure, um, you know, more important than ever um, as a gathering place, as a source of knowledge, um, uh, as um, an iconic, uh, iconic force that, you know, we see each other in. It breaks down differences to a certain degree. Um, so anyways, I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about, uh, you know, the context and the sighting, which again, I, I really love for all kinds of reasons. I liked it too. You know, we, Michelle, we talked about a lot of different sites, um, especially, you know, because we had then an extended amount of time to talk about it because of COVID and everything. So this actually happened a year later than we had first meant for it to happen. But what's great about that is this site became a possibility. And what I liked about the site, yes, is that a uh, being next to this civic building, you know, it's a, civic buildings have a history of having outdoor sculpture in front of them. Um, this is probably not one that many libraries would have out in front of them, you know, maybe a lion or a guy on a horse or, you know, a very abstracted sculpture. So for me, um, that was exciting, but this particular little cutout in the sidewalk um, with benches on either end so that people can sit there and, you know, uh, have their lunch or have a phone call um, and having a sculpture in that location to me um, was also a really nice feature. It's also right next to the road. So the vantage points from which people can experience the piece um, are many, you know, from inside the library, sitting on the benches, walking on the sidewalk, driving by in the bus, you know, that goes down the road there next to it. I mean, um, so, so, so all of those things together really felt like the right place. Yeah. I thought about it mainly in terms, well, in two terms, uh, 
one, the architecture of like the high modernism behind it and sort of like the like regular rectilinearity uh, in contrast with um, what I was painting. I found that, I don't know, very, very satisfying um, to have that juxtaposition. Uh, and I also, I, I also thought of it mainly in the context of like, of um, who goes to a library or around a library. Um, in my experience, that that tends to be like a broad swath of, of every kind of person uh, from like, I don't know, like um, from like librarians to homeless people to like pro professors to, to like, I don't know, people having lunch on from their business breaks just in the area. I mean, that's just what I imagine. I don't really know the area very well. Well, the court, um, yeah, the courthouse, remember, is yeah. the caddy corner. Um, so there was a lot of activity. We had, yeah. uh, you know. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I've just, I just found that sort of uh, an exciting place to like, to have something. Um, I don't know if it like directly affected what I did, but it, it, um, it, I was, I was very, I don't know. I mean, as someone who normally hangs things inside that where people have to be really interested in them to go see it, this was like, oh, I'm gonna, a lot of people who don't want this or don't care about this are gonna see it. And that's so exciting to me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, I, I um, you know, also, and Kelty, this was the first time for you, but, you know, I've installed sculpture outdoors quite a lot at this point, and the yeah. conversations you get in with um, passersby are always very interesting, um, and I've even gotten involved in conversations and the passersby don't know I'm the sculptor, the artist, and um, oh, wow. those are those are really interesting. You know, when they ask for my <laughs> opinion, they ask for my opinion or or ask what he thought when he made this sculpture. You know, it's always <laughs> it's always a dude that's made the sculpture. Um, so you know, I play along. I, I always learn something. You know, I I never I'm not offended or anything like that. So um, yeah, it's it's a uh, you really put yourself out there. You know, when you're doing these things and. And, you know, we had talked about the possibility of you painting this in your studio and that kind of thing. But I really think that it, it, for many reasons, doing it on site, um, you know, it is a benefit to us and the people that walk by, you know, it's like we all can then engage and who knows where, where that sends us. It's kind of more interesting in that way. Yeah, yeah. 100%. Yeah, no, Virginia, thanks for bringing that up. I, I've been fortunate enough to see both of you um, working. Uh, so Virginia, I saw you working on a large sculpture commission um, in Cleveland. Uh, yeah. when I was the artistic director of Front. Um, and then Kelty, I've been in your studio many times. And uh, I'm, I'm very honored to have written the first essay, your first uh, essay yeah. for your first exhibition catalog way back in I know. Yeah. Uh, time ago. Um, so uh, Brad is traveling with me and he's sitting uh, in the, uh, he's sitting next to me over here off, off uh, my Zoom camera. And he has a question actually about um, the truck, uh, the uh, F-150 Ford truck. And, uh, you know, after driving from, you know, Chicago down to Georgia, again, through Louisville, which is um, uh, Kelty's hometown and Nashville today, which is Virginia's hometown. Um, I'm in Georgia and thinking about the truck as, um, uh, you know, what it, what it what does it represent symbolically? How does it how how is it framed up in regionality um, and authority and power? Right, right now we have a uh, you know, uh, when when Brad and I are in northern Wisconsin uh, at the poor farm. You know, the uh, it kind of breaks two ways. You either have your very big truck um, or you have your Subaru. Um, that's that, and we talk about that with identity. I'm just wondering how that plays in um, Virginia with using a truck, and then particularly uh, Kelty coming in with, um, uh, you know, the dissolve. Um, you know, is there an inherent critique in the project where there's a kind of erasure again that happens, or an attempt at erasure uh, through the kind of dissolving, um, you know, gestures of uh, light, full spectrum, um, and spray paint. <laughs> Um, so, uh, I'll just talk about the 
trucks truck issue. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> this is actually a, a Dodge Ram 150. I know it's covered, so it's hard to see that. Um, the shape of the Dodge Ram, it's kind of funny. Um, you know, they, they didn't, they, they stayed with the same body model for many years, well beyond what most people would have wanted. So this truck, even though it's a 93, has a has an older look to it um, when you see it. So, you know, and I've used a lot of different trucks, um, uh, different, different sizes, you know, full size, long beds, short beds, small trucks. I mean, just everything, but really the idea of using trucks, I mean, for me, wasn't so much, I mean, I guess, yeah, all of it's inherent, the, the, the power of a truck, the masculinity of a truck, the southernness of a truck. I mean, you could attribute all of those things to it, but I'll, I'll say one in my travels, there are trucks around the entire world um, and they are useful. They're so useful. And for me growing up in a place where there were lots of trucks, I got the opportunity to see different kinetic sculptures every day. Because if you think about a truck, you know, people load this stuff in, they drive it around. Uh, and then when they get there, they unload it and it doesn't, you know, it's, it's a temporary, it's a temporary object, you know, temporary sculpture. And, and for me that, that along with my familiarity and comfort level with trucks is what made me use them that, and that automobiles are meant to be outside. So when I started getting asked to do large scale outdoor sculptures, like, Oh God, what am I going to do? What can I afford? Well, you know, I had a truck, so that would, that was my first outdoor sculpture, you know, because I could just put a bunch of junk in the back of it and do a couple of things. And then it was like a sculpture and it was a sculpture. And so I kind of got into that idea of making these things, not just using the truck as a platform, you know, not just as like a base for a larger piece, but actually trying to integrate the whole thing and, and really like uh, make it a, an object in and of itself. And whether it was truck, or not, it wasn't necessarily um, something that I was too concerned about, but more like, did the sculpture overall act the way I wanted it to? Um, so that's a general overview of my interest yeah. in trucks, but. Well, I, you know, how I thought about it, and, and I guess one reason why I wanted to dissolve it somewhat was because in the, the original sculpture was a truck and um, plants. Uh, sort of in uh, like the basic just juxtaposition of that sculpture that not to completely oversimplify it is is sort of like this strong masculine uh, manufactured object and nature you know like and one and and so and because this is the winter winterization of it we've lost the the nature the, the wild pond that was in the back you know so so I was trying to I guess in some ways bring some back, something back, some sort of contrast back to it that I think it had lost in its winterization. Um, and, uh, and sort of reinstate like a, 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 um, a I don't know, a counterpoint. Um, I, you know, when you say like, do I have a critique of trucks? I guess maybe like deep down I do. I mean, I'm like, if it, I, I wonder like, had it been a bike, would I have wanted to dissolve it as much? I don't know, you know, like, cause I'm not a truck person. I don't have a truck. I probably never, I'm a soup. I, I drive a Subaru. And, and even that I kind of, you know. You got it's, two kinds of people in the world. The people know, who drive trucks and the people who drive Subarus. So you, know, you tell a person. <laughs> <laughs> whatever you know but yeah it is also just like um objectness like I mean as I said like at the beginning like there's like my interest is like things uh, I don't know the the objectifying thingness in 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 my work and had it been a truck I probably had it not been a truck yes I, I probably still would have wanted to do, to do that as much as one can and it's obviously like a failed enterprise because we're still talking about a truck because it's it's shaped like a truck. <laughs> Damn it! But yeah, you're right, and and also I think, but also I think that's me working with you because you're like it's not a truck, it's a sculpture. I'm like, yeah, it's like a form that needs to be like undone somewhere. Totally, and I mean, you know, yeah. you you hit the nail on the head. I mean, it's it's hard to undo a truck in in people's right. minds. I mean, right. even even shipping this thing from my studio to Milwaukee, they're like, can't we just drive it there? 
can we just tow it behind a U-Haul? And I'm like, well, um, you know, no, uh, it doesn't, <laughs> it's a, it's a sculpture. It's not a drivable. I mean, it, you could drive it, but, but you, you, you know, it's a gas guzzler too. So why would you want to, but anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, no, no, it's, it's an interesting quandary. Yeah. Uh, mm. I think the least truck thing I've ever made is a truck that I took completely apart. Um, and oh, wow. it, it still looks like a vehicle, um, and a truck, actually, you can see the whole thing. I don't know. You know it's a truck. I don't yeah. mind that people know it's a truck. Yeah. No, no. I, I, there was a <laughs> moment I was giving a tour of folks from Marquette University. And uh, we were. this was, this was prior uh, to Kelty's um, uh, painting. And there was, there was one fellow who recognized the truck as something that well, he, he must have had an experience. He's, it was particularly the American South, but how trucks then will be parked and kind of dissolve over the years. And, you know, they will accumulate water, they'll accumulate plants. Um, so they become oh, these right. kind of natural environments and try to be consumed back into nature. And he recognized that right away. It was pretty great. Um, we have a question, uh, um, question, I guess it's a question and it's from uh, Ruth Freeman and, uh, Ruth says, um, I like how you talk about color and its mystery, Kelty. And what is it really? And what other elements define it, such as light and form? Do you all think about how the natural elements, temperature, water, such as rain and snow, would be a character in the sculpture and more specifically the color? So that was a question from the audience. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I, I thought of these things like, um, like the, the, I mean, in, in some really didactic ways, I thought of the lines as waves, which was to me, um, you know, references water, sound, and I don't know, maybe even sand, you know, uh, anything that, that forms a wave. And, um, and yeah, I wanted to show the whole spectrum. Of course, that, that was sort of a failed project, but, um, and metal, oh, there's also quite a bit of metallic paint in there that created like sort of a, um, I don't know, a glare that seemed promising and useful on a three-dimensional thing uh, that I can't quite explain at this point. But um, um, yeah, like even, even in these photos, like I really like the, the like how the, it has this uneven light half the time when in the, the, the light coming through the trees. Um, I've never really, um, worked with that as you know because I've never made anything outside so that was I don't know and so there's so many different forms of light there's so many different forms of um color and um and then there's like the, the like illusionistic ones I'm thinking of like waves yeah it also just to add to that I mean you know I don't know Kelty um uh, I'm not familiar with you often painting outside but I think that like painting outside and having direct natural light on this thing and mm -hmm. over the course of days as the sun is moving and the light is changing um it, it really sort of comes alive and you you know uh I think everybody saw from the picture earlier that originally the cover as as it's purchased is this sort of a little bit metallic-y kind of silver color which ended up I think being a plus for mm -hmm. your layering of paint and the way that you talk about like having these layers that can be seen through one another you know um, one i uh, got another good question here um uh from somebody who, who uh with very instrumental into um, our organization, Sculpture Milwaukee, and that's uh, Bianca Bova, who's our curator. And she says, it's a good question. Um, can you talk about the decision to leave the truck covers texture intact rather than pressing out the pack increases before Kelty painted it? What is the relationship between the texture of the cover and the overall sculptural form once installed? Yeah, we did originally think about, it's true, we did um, discuss that. And um, and I think um, the idea was to just embrace the, 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 um, the properties of, of a fabric over a truck um, and to embrace, I don't know, to embrace all the material problems that, that, the, um, that the original 
sculpts are created. And if those worked against the fab, the painting, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm really pro like, <laughs> pro contrast. I'm pro like <laughs> a, a war being taken, uh, you know, um, now in, in a, uh, if I were to, I don't know, to, if I were to do this again, would I enjoy trying it other ways? Yes, but, but um, uh, and, and see what, but for, for the moment I was like, I want it, I want the thingness to be, I don't know, uh, um, exact, no, exaggerated or, or made, made as clear as possible. I mean, it's, the thing is, is like in painting, you spend so much time like making the perfect surface for your paint. It was kind of like freeing to like um, embrace in, um, uh, a surface with, with so much personality that it's actually my friend's artwork I mean <laughs> you know <laughs> well and, and, you know? and yeah and to and to that point I think that like the fact that this thing had wrinkles and bumps and all this weird stuff in it sort of even pushed the idea of the surface of the painting this that it becomes sculptural even even more that we weren't I don't think that the approach for this one was to have this really fine smooth like you know, gessoed, sanded, layered canvas, but rather to kind of let it, as you say, let it be, it, let it have its objectness. Um, and I think those wrinkles and bumps and weird seams and things added added to that. Yeah, yeah, I I, I agree. I mean, it, it's kind of it's already the ghost of the truck, right? Yeah. Um, one um, uh, one last question and it comes from Jason Pickleman who is another artist uh, in uh, the 2021 there is this we, um, we if you don't know the work everybody should go out and take a look at it it's a it's a, it's a great piece in the third ward um, and Jason says does the painted tarp have a second life in the spring or summer so I think that kind of goes to um, my I I Idea about making these, I I feel like the covers for the sculptures are their own sculptures. Um, I have a dream of doing a sculpture show that's only the covers that I've made for sculptures at some point once I have enough of them, um, and literally just hanging them in the room in sort of a three dimensional way um, because they are they are an object and I, I you know, I want to like think about that and um, work with that idea more. So for sure, this this thing will continue on. I mean, Kelty and I've also talked about other things of scanning parts of it and making fabric and actually sewing another cover using that. So it's, it's a really kind of generative process. And I think we've just begun kind of diving into it. So Kelty, get ready. I'm ready. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>